So um, welcome everyone um, to the NASA conference, Countdown to T-0 in the realm of astronaut makers. Good morning to everyone in Australia. Good afternoon, good evening to everyone worldwide. Um, I'm Abina, I'm a student at the University of Queensland and the Vice President at UQ Biotechnology Society. And I'm here to welcome you uh, all to the conference. Today we have Dr. Ravi. Um, Dr. Ravi has worked with NASA for 28 years as the Chief Launchpad System Engineer and System Safety Engineer on the Space Shuttle Program. He's also worked on both the launch pads from where NASA sent humans to land on the moon. Dr. Ravi was also the chair, co-chair of the Ground Safety Review Panel for all payloads going to the International Space Station. So now we'll be hearing more about uh, Dr. Ravi and his journey to NASA. Dr. Ravi, I'll let you take on from here. Okay, uh, thanks, Arbina. Um, it's a great uh, honor and privilege for me to be uh, being here today. Uh, it's very important that you know I do this uh, lecture, and I want to dedicate this lecture to my dad, uh, my father, who passed away in uh, Melbourne last year, July 2020. Uh, in fact, my mo mother was an Aussie also. Um, and she, was, she passed away in 2005. So I want to dedicate this lecture to my parents. And it's very important that I do that because I, I am I'm greatly um, in love with Australia. I've been there many times. Uh, I think it's a great country and I would like to come back again. I know all, all your astronauts, um, Andy Thomas, uh, Pamela Melroy, who's going to be settling down there. So with that, let's uh, start the lecture. Um, so. Uh, today, what we are going to do is basically uh, just a brief overview of uh, uh, countdown to T minus zero. It's it's a it's a title I used to uh, basically uh, write my memoir, and uh, but I'm not going to go through too much of the information there. Just highlight uh, some of the major activities uh, on how I reached NASA, but also more importantly, I want to inspire the next generation of engineers and scientists to do the best in whatever they want to do. Uh, with that, uh, let's uh, what, what was, uh, uh, share, say one thing. You know, uh, space is the ultimate destination to orchestrate the creations of your heart and That's chisel true. the uh, dreams within your mind. It's very important that the man's mind grows in the space we are allowed to operate. It's very important. So our space has to be very big. Uh, next slide. So uh, this is a beautiful picture of uh, uh, taken by Spitzer of the uh, heavens, basically. Uh, this spans about 900 light years, uh, and uh, it's an amazing view. Um, next, uh, click on the slide. Uh, Earth is a cradle of mankind, um, but one cannot live in this cradle forever. Can you click on the slide? Can you, can you uh, advance the slide? I'm sorry. Um, uh, can you advance the slide? Yeah, oh, sorry, <laughs> I should have said advanced. Uh, uh, so basically Earth is a cradle of mankind, but one cannot live uh, in the cradle forever. And that applies to everybody, including me and all the people who are uh, in this world, basically. You can't live in this cradle or your home place and you have to find out and explore, basically. Next slide. Ne next slide. Uh, NASA is uh, really a global leader in space exploration. Um, in the past uh, 60 to 100,000 years, as mankind traveled from Africa to, uh, uh, to many parts of the world, um, you know, it's not significant things happened, but in the last 60 years, we have seen tremendous uh, changes in what uh, mankind has done, basically. So, you know, I was really lucky to live in this time slice uh, uh, of uh, last 60 years, and it is amazing journey. Uh, we have seen almost 200 billion stars where before we just saw 200 countries on earth. Hubble alone has uh, seen more than 1 billion trillion stars in the universe, majority of it. Um, if you look at the arrows on the picture, you know, uh, in my own first year at NASA, I have sent probes to Sun, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. I mean, it's an amazing journey that what one can do. So what I'm try trying to impress upon you is that you know, your potential is phenomenal. Next slide. So we must become the change what we see. 
uh, man is what essentially what the thought he entertains. It's a trigger, basically. It's a imagination. Uh, imagination is like the highest kite you can fly. Uh, Disney, Walt Disney used to say, imagination is more important than knowledge. A lot of times we reach our destination with the wrong map, unsteady thought, poor vision, lack of knowledge. But that's where creativity and uh, you know other things come into picture. Next slide. So basically, this is a story about my um, uh, two journeys, uh, uh, which started from shores of India uh, uh, with a common passion of pursuit of flight. Uh, not knowing, uh, you know, each other, we journeyed to the same destination, NASA Kennedy Space Center. Uh, one dared mighty things, and uh, she became an astronaut. She's the first Indian woman to go in space. Uh, well, I was uh, not that bold or I didn't dare mighty things. So I took the path which was never traveled. In any case, became her astronaut maker. So it is amazing journey that I had from the shores of India, gateway of India to gateway to space. And in the process, I learned so many things and I became NASA's astronaut maker. Next slide. So this is Kalpana Chawla. She is one of the astronauts who died on Columbia uh, in a, on a STS 107 mission in 19 in 2003. Uh, she she was the I was the only Indian to work on the NASA moon launch pads, and I was privileged to launch the first Indian moon uh, to space twice. The second time, as you know, we lost her uh, just before landing. Next slide. So this slide uh, really uh, next slide. Um, so basically, this slide talks a little bit about possibilities. Uh, sorry, go back. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this slide talks about possibilities. You know, when your teacher used to say, when we were growing up, I say, okay, you know, one question, one answer. No, you know, now NASA looks at many possibilities. So one question, many possibilities. Very important that, that uh, we understand uh, 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 that innovation happens when you have many, many answers to the same question. One question may be the best answer, but one answer may be the best, uh, I mean, uh, answer, one answer could be the best suitable for the question, but there are many, many question, uh, answers. We can develop new technologies, new innovations, and they may even answer new type of questions. So what I'm doing is basically, uh, I don't want you to write down all this, I'm gonna give you the slides, but this is a beautiful crux of what uh, it means to be successful. If you want to be a genius, just follow this. And if you see some on the right side, some of the people uh, who have become very famous and uh, very well known in the world, and they have followed the same system. Next slide. <laughs> so uh, let's talk a little bit about the foundation years. Next slide. I was born in 1953, the same year, uh, uh, DNA was discovered, the double helix uh, by Watson and Crick in UK. I've been to Cambridge, found the place where they are signed off. Uh, it's amazing. The same year, uh, Tenzing, Norgay and Hillary, uh, um, uh, they uh, climbed Mount Everest uh, in 1953, about uh, middle of the year. So it was an amazing year. I was born the same year uh, as them. So that's the only context I can bring up about, you know, when it comes to my uh, journey. Next slide. So I'm sort of an ordinary person, but I'm, I've worked, lived, and uh, experienced extraordinary space. Unlike many, many people will really try to be in my shoes. It's not going to happen because sometimes the time slice of the history comes and goes, but I'm not worried about that. I'm not saying that you should follow my in my shoes or follow my path. You can do much better than us. And that's what this message is about. So my journey from Gateway of India to Gateway to the Universe or Gateway to Space was, was very tough, but you know it happened basically. Next slide. So here uh, I was growing up in I grew up in Burma, Afghanistan, and Middle East as I uh, as a kid. Uh, my dad worked in various places. So uh, can you imagine this is me in 1956, a three-year-old kid working around the machinery. And what you see here in the old jungles of Burma, uh, and, and now 40, 50 years later, you know, I'm NASA's uh, top engineer. So it is possible that you know, if I can do it, 
all the all of you are much smarter than me and you can do it next slide once in a while you and me and everybody else we need a kick in the back kick in the pants and uh, sputnik which is a small ball uh, you know uh, it really uh, flew in 1957 it gave a kick in the pants for us technology and innovation sometimes we need competitiveness next slide so as i said uh, you know we were going to uh, not focus on what i'm telling you on the slide but just remember that building up on other people's knowledge is very important you don't have to reinvent the wheel uh, people like even famous physicists the physicists like uh, richard feynman they all uh, applied their knowledge from sometimes from fundamentals sometimes they use somebody else's knowledge next slide so in 1962 uh, john f kennedy who is my hero um, uh, gave a speech called we chose to go, uh, go to the moon uh, not because it was easy but it was difficult you know he came up with a very simple message which anybody could understand man moon 1970 how hard it can be when in 1962 8 years earlier he made that proclamation and that is what you and me want to do we don't want to have this complex ideas where it is very hard for us to understand what is going on with our goals and objectives keep it simple stupid our simplicity is the ultimate sophistication like leonardo da vinci said next slide so back in uh, 1964 i came i was living in kabul afghanistan i came back and this is a beautiful story i don't want to go too much into detail but there's a bollywood movie first color movie and uh, really there was a pilot who uh, on the rightmost side in the middle there is be- his best friend and a beautiful girl so as the story goes the pilot gets called to war between india and pakistan he goes and dies there but before he goes he says to his best friend take care of my girlfriend but then you know bollywood movies never end in uh, uh, sadness you know it's always happy ending so they uh, the pilot comes back and says hey i want my girlfriend back so then he takes her uh, on a honeymoon to london paris zurich switzerland as a 10 year old when i saw this movie i said wow this must be great if i become a pilot i can not only marry a beautiful girl but go around the world guess what i did both never became a pilot <laughs> so sometimes you know there is other reasons why it happens like that and we'll continue the journey next slide so here is 1966 i was not a great student in fact i was a failure many many times i have failed in my class my dad and mom thought i was a f- total failure i was a nobody you know really they thought and they they had given up on me uh, but but you know in the long run if you think believe dream and dare anything can possible there's a very good book by pa- paulo coelho the alchemist there's a quote in the book it says uh, if you dream you know the world will collude with you to make it happen and we'll see that as we go along next slide so uh, impossible you know uh, if you look at it in a dictionary throw it out there is no such word as impossible it says how you read it i am possible impossible means i am possible so look at this picture here from india in 1964 when my dream came in less than 25 years and i was running this launch pad you saw the earlier picture in burma where i was running uh, standing next to a small caterpillar okay that is uh, a construction equipment here i'm working on a launch pad launching rocket sending people to space like your own andy thomas pamela melroy many many 700 astronauts to be precise launching 100 rockets like this at a cost of 500 million dollars per launch so is it possible yes it it did it was possible it just uh, 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 depends on where you want to go basically next slide so uh, you know it's important that you know uh, impossible means i'm possible and that is what i want you to run your life by next slide so the same year when we had the apollo 13 disaster in 1970 i i uh, failed desperately in uh, my high school and uh, college and my mom was very devastated and she took me to a different city in india bangalore which is the hub of it now in the international hub of it and uh, i went to college there uh, undergrad bachelor's degree in engineering and that was the best thing if i was not an engineer i would never be in nasa so uh, 
Apollo 13 was NASA's finest tower, you know. Uh, three, these three men were stuck beyond the physical reach of humankind, but not beyond the reach of human intelligence, imagination, and ingenuity. With those three words, uh, Gene Kranz, one of our director, he brought these men back. That's an amazing tenacity of NASA engineers working both in space, the three um, stranded astronauts and the remaining people on Earth. Next slide. So not only you want to uh, learn from others, but also you want to increase the breadth and depth of knowledge. And let's see how we did it. Next slide. So this is a nice quote from Robert Frost. Uh, two roads diverged uh, in a wood, and I, I uh, took the one less traveled, and that made all the difference. So really, uh, for me, next slide. Uh, after 1975, when I graduated from uh, Bangalore University, my dad said, okay, you go, go anywhere you want in the world. And I wanted to work for Mercedes-Benz because in NASA, we always were taught that mission success starts with safety and safety starts with engineering excellence. And we want to be the best in whatever we do. You know? And uh, uh, so basically engineering excellence for Mercedes-Benz was what I was dreaming of. But the problem was it was impossible for me to get in because I didn't know German and other things. Next slide. So basically, my aunt in Chicago said, if you come to America, you can not only get your master's and PhD in five years instead of studying those same five years in Germany. So just like Columbus, we both sailed from Europe. Uh, Columbus obviously founded years ago from Portugal, I guess. And I, he was looking for India and I was going away from India. And uh, my goal was to, to go and you know, sort of conquer the world. Go West, young man. That was the theory my, my father liked because he was a you know brilliant guy who was very uh, daring. Uh, he did mighty things. Next slide. So I landed in Chicago uh, in 1975, December. Guess what? No money. I had less than several thousand dollars. Uh, I didn't have a green card. I didn't have a visa. My stay was six to eight weeks. I didn't have money and I didn't have place. To, well, I had a place to stay, but no admission to the college. And guess what? If I didn't stay there, uh, I mean, if I didn't get a visa converted and my uh, get into a school or uh, admission into a master's program, I would be coming back to India. So it so happened the first day when I landed in Chicago, I, I turned on the TV and I saw this show called I Dream of Genie. And this genie comes out of the bottle and says, Master, what do you want, you know? And I think I was looking at and I said, I want to live in America, stay in America and work in America, never knowing that, you know, eventually my path would lead to NASA. And uh, many times I'm a VIP tour guide for NASA, uh, taking care of all the dignitaries, uh, including some of your own ambassadors uh, from Washington, uh, Australian ambassador to the United States. And they all asked me and said, Dr. Ravi, what made you come to NASA? I said, well, well I was living in Chicago and I, I saw this uh, genie living in Cocoa Beach, Florida. That's where Kennedy Space Center is. And maybe I thought, you know, I, I just fell in love with her. I'm, I tried to follow her to NASA, I guess. <laughs> so that was my theory here. Next slide. So, you know, a lot of times uh, when, when you look at uh, random things, uh, open your eyes and ears when you go out in the open because innovation ha happens when there's a... Uh, 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 limited, uh, what do you call, uh, a limitation in the prior state of the art. What is it, what do I mean? So there was a time when uh, William Sado, one of the American uh, uh, engineers, he went to South America and he saw uh, his suitcase being carried by some porter on his head. And then they put, it, put him in a uh, horse cart. So he said, how come, you know, we have this porter carrying the suitcase to the horse cart and then horse cart is on wheels. So why can't I put uh, wheels on the suitcase? Guess what? His idea became a billion dollar idea and he became the richest, one of the richest men in America. So putting two concepts, next slide. Putting two concepts together is very important. So connecting the dots, putting the concepts together. So I was a tribologist. I started the, uh, there's a big difference between tribology and trichology. I know uh, people get confused. So no, no, I don't I have nothing to do with hair. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, uh, tribology means uh, three things, study of three things, uh, friction, wear, and lubrication. Uh, next slide. So uh, what I did was 
we did work on various uh, 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 railroad systems at that time. See, when you're a beggar, you cannot be a chooser. So I said, I'm an aerospace engineer studying at IIT Chicago, but you know I don't have a job. So I'll take any job, which even takes me to railroads. So you're going in the journey of life and you have a basket, which is empty, and you put all your skills in there and you keep on going because that skill, the railroad skill may be used somewhere else sometime. And I can tell you a story about that. So in this case, the uh, uh, railroad down the uh, top here, it would slip and it would not stop at the train station. So we took the wheel and put some kind of nickel titanium alloy, it's called the shape memory alloy. And this is how you look at the problem and solve, and then it becomes an innovation. So understanding the physics of the problem, if you have a problem in your own life and career, you know, study the physics of the problem, uh, root cause of the problem, we'll talk about it later. So that is very important. Next slide. Uh, this is very important to me, building multidimensional knowledge. So just because I was a railroad engineer uh, didn't mean anything because I was an aerospace engineer, but worked in railroads. Next slide. So luckily by 1981, I had quit the railroads and joined uh, Bill Boeing's company. Bill Boeing was the father of uh, 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 Boeing aircraft company, uh, the seaplanes, uh, for delivery of uh, mail and all those things in those days. And, you know, Boeing Company is one of the famous companies in the world now. So now look at my career and life. I'm, I'm coming from India to America with a dream saying that I wanted to fly, but I couldn't afford to fly because my mom said, if you fly, you die. My dad said, no money. So really, uh, in the end, my dream was alive. So when I came, I luckily got into Boeing Company. Next slide. So, but Boeing put me into railroads again. <laughs> so it's kind of, uh, we went to Colorado and I was managing, uh, working with $100 million railroad test facility for Boeing. Uh, it had a lot of sand, a lot of scorpions, a lot of snakes, and we used to walk the railroad. But you have to do it because that's the multidisciplinary knowledge you want to develop. Next slide. So a lot of times, you know, they would ask me to test some railroads and, uh, you know, we would uh, learn from your mistakes. So that's the plan. Uh, here, there's a flatbed car. It wanted, they wanted to test it with uh, 300 tons load on it, but we are in the middle of a desert. There is no way I can get 300 tons, you know? <laughs> so a lot of times, you know, you learn from your mistakes, but important to have, plan, uh, have a plan. You know, planning is more important than having a plan, but also, you know, pre-planning, we call it. That is very important. Next slide. So, here I go from railroads, I come into mining testing. How about that for Boeing? But this is one of the biggest, largest uh, mining testing facility in the world. And I know Australia has many, many, many mines. And I'm sure you have what they call as that yellow thing in the center called shields. You know, They support the roof and the bottom floor of the mine, basically, too, so that the miners can be safe. Next slide. So, you know... I invented, innovated, and explored. You know, I built this five million or two and a half million kilos pound load cell because, you know, on the previous slide, the testing machine was not calibrated. So I had to design this from scratch. I had no clue how to do it, but you study and do it. Next slide. So let's go back a little bit with uh, Da Vinci, who's my hero, basically. He always built multidimensional knowledge. Look at a letter, you know, this is Leonardo da Vinci asking for a job, you know, <laughs> and he writes to a wealthy baron. He says, you know, uh, uh, I can work in offense and defense. I can build any uh, design uh, uh, armament and stuff like that. But then the, you know, the baron asked, what happens if there's no war? He said, no, don't worry. I can, I can uh, paint and I can do sculptures and stuff like that. How about that? You know, so. Mona Lisa was a classic example that Leonardo da Vinci not only could, you know, paint, but also he could uh, cut a cadaver right under the church's nose in the church to see how the veins worked or how a uh, human body worked. So he was so curious. And one time he said, uh, well, next slide. Next slide. Uh, so what he said was that, that there shall be veins uh, if this accomplishment is not for me, let it be for others. So this is the design of a helicopter. 
And if you are following um, Mars Ingenuity helicopter, it's exactly almost similar to that design. Not that NASA copied his design, but philosophy is the same, basically. So 500 years ago, uh, Leonardo da Vinci was really working on helicopters. But, you know, just like, uh, I just want to bring up my own thoughts here. I never became an astronaut. I never, like um, uh, uh, Andy Thomas, but, but I became something like an astronaut maker. So a lot of times, you know, you may not be able to fly. I never was able to fly, as you said, but I got to work in two best companies in the world, aerospace companies, Boeing and NASA. Boeing for first 10 years, NASA for last 30 years. Next slide. So you just don't give up. So a lot of times we want to make uh, existing be uh, things better. So these are ideas I'm giving you. So the, the, on the right, it's called the V-22 Osprey. That is one of the tilt rotor helicopters. Uh, I, I know that Australian government also has that. So basically the rotor uh, goes, it goes up like a helicopter and then the whole rotor tilts 90 degrees, then it goes as a plane. On the left, Boeing 360, that is a Chinook type helicopter, troop carrier. And I've seen Aust many Australian cities having that kind of uh, helicopter. Next slide. So basically, the uh, you can click on the link. Yeah, uh, both uh, you can click on both links uh, if you can. Um, you know, this is just I want to show you. You know, when when you have uh, a study, you go deeply into what uh, what is possible. So you you want to be the best in whatever you are doing. I'm not saying you should be an astronaut like Andy Thomas or astronaut maker like me. Whatever you want to follow, you want to follow technology, biotechnology, whatever you want. You know, you go all the way into the uh, system and understand everything to the core. Next slide. So here is uh, some of the work I did. So you have to have a very clear vision, laser focus. So remember, we talked about suitcase with wheels. Uh, here's another example of... Uh, composite shaft coupling we made, uh, instead of steel coupling, we made composite material. So a uh, lot of times, you know, in the bottom left, you right, you see um, uh, gears, you know, most of the gears, usually uh, when you have two pairs of gears, only one gear of teeth touch each other. Here we are touching, uh, making sure that three pairs of teeth were load sharing. So this is a new concept. So basically, it's important that you keep on innovating if you want to succeed in life. Next slide. So connecting the dots is very important in NASA. Next slide. So one time uh, when we were working on the shuttle program, uh, one of the engineers came to his boss in NASA and said, hey boss, uh, if the space shuttle is a glider, who uh, goes up like a rocket but comes as a glider. So if it lands in California or some other place, how do we bring it to Florida? So he said, buy a plane ticket. And the manager looked, uh, the employee looked at the manager and said, what do you mean buying a buy a plane ticket? This, this won't fit inside, right? <laughs> so guess what? We put it on the top, basically. So, you know, you always have to look at uh, a problem and say, hey, I can I can solve it in a different way. So next slide. Uh, many times we do make mistakes. NASA is always big in making mistakes. This is one of the Mars Climate Observer. You know, can you imagine uh, such a great agency like NASA? We make mistakes like unit con conversion, you know, instead of using pounds, uh, you know, sometimes we use newtons and that creates a problem on landing or whatever, you know. So basically, you have to be meticulous in whatever you do uh, in your work. So excellence, it's like almost like a gold standard, you know, in whatever you do. Next slide. So launching rockets, I tell people, is not like uh, flipping burgers or flipping pizza, you know. There's a lot of, lot of hazards of launching rockets. And uh, some of the uh, things come from environment, some of the hazards in space. So even getting off the rocket, off the launch pad is impossible sometimes. You know, you're talking about, let's say, 6 million, um, 4 million kilo rocket will require 6 million pounds of thrust, almost 2 million kilos more to go against the gravity. And you're going at very high speed from 0 to Mach 25 or 28,000 kilometers per hour in a matter of 8 minutes. Next slide. So NASA has been a story of remarkable achievements, but it, it has been interspersed with a lot of, lot of spectacular failures. As I said, in my own life, I had failures, but when I came to NASA looking at Apollo 13, Apollo 1, fire, uh, 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 you know, Hubble Space Telescope uh, problems, uh, problems when we had Columbia accident uh, in this middle 
uh, uh, you see uh, 200,000 pieces of columbia came down to her. You know, once upon a time, it was a beautiful bird. And now it comes back with the uh, same thing with challenger accident. So next slide. So, you know, we have to pay a very big price when you are launching humans. That's what I did. I launched 100 rockets with uh, seven, at least seven astronauts. So we are talking about more than 600 people to space. You know, in the history of uh, the world, you know, this kind of uh, uh, launching doesn't happen in a matter of 30 years. You know, this is from 2000, 1981 to 2000, 2011. We launched almost 130 rockets. And in, in my life, uh, in my career, I launched 100 out of the 130 because I came late to NASA. Uh, so we, this is the accident uh, of Colum a Challenger with the O-ring problem. So a lot of times, you know, uh, the engineers have to speak up with, to the managers uh, where managers can make mistakes and make wrong judgments. So be up. Don't, if you see something, say something. Next slide. Columbia is the same problem. A foam uh, coming from one of the tanks, oxygen, uh, oxygen, hydrogen tanks, the orange tank, it came and hit the leading edge and made a small pinhole and the plasma went into that. And then you see on the left, you know, it came into earth with 200,000 pieces of more basically. So next slide. So this is a very uh, important slide for you. Uh, always remember, uh, if you want to read a book by Henry Petrosky, uh, yeah, that's a great book. Uh, read all his books. Failure is central to engineering. Every calculation we engineers make is a failure calculation. So because we don't understand the failure criteria itself. So everything we do is a meaningless number until it fails, you know, then we fix it by adding extra margin of safety, basically. So, you know, success is a very bad, uh, uh, bad thing. You learn more from failures than successes. Uh, next slide. So here is a, uh, you can click on the other side also, uh, other slide also. Uh, this is the main engine uh, rocket lift off. It doesn't have the sound, but uh, this one should have the sound. Um, so uh, I can play it again. So these are liquid engines and solid engines, basically. Uh, I'm just showing you uh, uh, how uh, innovative ideas we came. So if you look at the left slide here, you know, if you look at the dumbbell, uh, now it's 3000 degrees temperature coming out of that, you know, uh, the jet exhaust is Mark, Mark 4, uh, 2800 miles per hour. And you see the whole dumbbell is going to bend now, you know, deform actually. It's called the nodal diameter or the bending mode. And, you know, now it should break literally. Why it doesn't break? Because NASA engineers put 1000 tubes going from the outer diameter to the inner diameter. And they flowed liquid oxygen right from there. So... This is very important for us, uh, uh, how to fix problems, basically. Next slide. So uh, I worked, when I came to NASA, they put me to work on this new ideas, new concept, field of vibroacoustics. What, what do you mean by vibroacoustics? Vibroacoustics means uh, that, that you know, we are talking about, uh, let's go to the next slide and uh, 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 you can see the liftoff of the sequence. So as the rocket lifts off, it, uh, you know, uh, creates a lot of noise uh, at liftoff, 190 decibels. If you are sitting on the launch pad, you'll be dead in a second. You know, if you are half a mile away, you'll be dead in a second. So this exhaust is coming at uh, 2,800 miles per hour right now. The solid rocket boosters will start now and it gives you a kickstart. And within a matter of few seconds, it leaves the pad. It's a beautiful scene uh, and uh, it does a roll maneuver. We're talking about almost 4 million kilos going up against gravity. Yeah, Newton come up, came up with gravity, but you know, we at NASA know how to go against gravity. It's very important that we understand. Now we are going along the coastline of Florida. We are going up in space. You can uh, see the beautiful coastline on the back there. Um, now uh, the, the, uh, the max Q, which is the maximum aerodynamic pressure of the rocket or the uh, wind and the uh, is coming on the rocket and it may fail. So we throttle down and then throttle up again. Now we are already in space in eight minutes. The solids are gone in two minutes and we are in space. So there's no other rocket like this, which can go from zero to uh, eight, uh, I mean zero to uh, 28,000 kilometers in a matter of like eight minutes. Now comes the orange tank is expanded because it doesn't have any more fuel. The shuttle is on its own. It will do a rotation and it will be an upside down maneuver basically. 
and now we are already in space. These guys are ready to roll and the astronauts are very happy. So this is what our job was basically. Uh, not once, not twice. Uh, but, you know, we'll talk a little bit about how many, how much amount of, there's like 3 million, 4 million parts. Everything has to work together. Next slide. So uh, with, with uh, the advent of uh, our technology, you know, uh, we not only looked at the rocket noise, 193 decibels, which can affect uh, a satellite or a payload, uh, which is like a Hubble Space Telescope sitting in the uh, payload compartment of the space shuttle. You know, if, if it damages, right? So at liftoff, there's, you know, nothing you can do. And once it goes into space, it's useless. So take a look at something like Perseverance rover or Mars helicopter ingenuity. If something happens on the launch pad, right? You can send it to Mars all, all day, all night. It's not going to work, you know, if it fails. So this is where the importance of sound and vibration come. And some of the vibrations were 100 Gs, basically. Next slide. So, uh, uh, you know, many times uh, innovating and learning, next slide, uh, 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 comes uh, from your own mistakes, but also, uh, you know, sometimes uh, this is a obelisk in Aswan uh, 3000 years ago when the, the pharaohs were asking the people to do the big, biggest obelisk in the world. And you know what happened was this obelisk, you know, you, when, when you want a 1200 ton obelisk, you don't bring the rock to your office, you know, to machine it. You, you do it in situ, meaning you go to the quarry and you cut the rock. That's what they did here. And then after working 10 years in hot sun, the Aswan high uh, sun, you know, this and putting all the hieroglyphics and all that, you know, there was a crack. Can you imagine that? You know, you don't want to be going and telling Pharaoh that, you know, your biggest obelisk has a crack now. So now the engineers were smart that they machined it again. So the crack went away. But by the time they finished the obelisk, again, another crack started. So it's kind of a purpose defeated. But, you know, you don't just don't want to give up because you failed. Next, next slide. This is the windows, to the ultimate uh, windows to the universe. You know, uh, when Hubble was launched, you know, uh, most of the world laughed at NASA. They said, look, Hubble cannot even see, you know, it has spherical aberration. But, but NASA and the astronauts were... Uh, they were there, they had the tenacity. You know, they said, okay, we are going to go up there and repair the Hubble. And not once, five times we repaired. Next slide. Uh, so this work is about, you know, probes like uh, far, far away. You know, if you are going like 1 million miles away from Earth, it is very hard to change or correct them. But very close up close, you can do, uh, you know, repairs and maintenance. Next slide. Uh, this was some problem we faced, uh, you can see me uh, bending down here, sitting down, and there's a coolant, water coolant pipe here. Uh, and uh, this coolant uh, pipe uh, flows water so that the heat inside the astronaut compartment comes out in the open, in the atmosphere in space, and it cools the crew compartment. But there was a, a freezing effect there. So I solved the problem. And because of that, I got one of the highest awards in NASA, we'll uh, show the picture a little bit later. It's called the Silver Snoopy Award. So, you know, as I said, look at multidisciplinary knowledge, just like Leonardo da Vinci, if you want to come up in life. Next slide. So here is a uh, design analysis of how to store oxygen in space and on Mars. Now, we, uh, the Perseverance rover just found out a little bit of oxygen and can convert from carbon dioxide. But how do you store it? And that's why we are using these balloons. And this picture is not from now, it goes back about 20 years. So we're already thinking ahead. So that is very critical. Um, next slide. So you have to sharpen your saw, uh, saw and uh, uh, apply the concepts. I remember we talked about uh, uh, you're carrying a box, an empty box, and you're putting all your skills and stuff like that. Next slide. So this, this slide is really very near and dear to me because this is my whole career in America. You know, on the top left is a railroad, uh, mining testing, again, railroad and mining, helicopters, uh, some uh, material testing, planes, Boeing planes. Then I came to NASA with the crawler transporter. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, doing Mars stuff, uh, solving problems, launching rockets, uh, launching Hubble, launching many, many probes. And in the end, you know, uh, building the International Space Station. Next slide. 
so uh, in the end you know uh, it's important that science and mathematics are very important to you engineering is the bridge between science uh, and mathematics and technology basically so uh, there's a nice quote by one uh, uh, one of our directors from uh, jpl he says that scientists see the world as is engineers create the world which uh, never was basically so you have to use the tools i'm not saying science is not important math is not important all are important here but it is important that you want to work in science is fine if you want to work in math is fine but bridge the gap with engineering and engineers next slide a lot of times we you know we develop technology in um, uk or in england before even the loss of thermodynamics we had the steam engines next slide so don't wait for anything you invent in you, you enhance the analytical tools so this is a picture of the spatial lift off but then we are modeling it on cfd and trying to understand how to solve the noise problem and uh, vibration problem next slide even before the right brothers uh, 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 i mean aerodynamic laws were there right brothers flew so many many people were already flying uh, helicopters and planes and stuff like that so don't wait for the laws to come over and and you follow the rules and laws you know you you develop your own technology next slide uh, one of my bosses in nasa would say that you know if i give a million dollars or billion dollars you could have never invented the microwave oven in your house today why because it came from a totally different field radar and nobody was watching that radar except one day uh, there was an engineer who had put his chocolate candy in his pocket and he went to very close to the radar and then started melting and then he realized hey that's microwave coming into my pocket and melting my candy you know and that's how you need to build on top of it next slide so when i came to nasa you saw the small uh, caterpillar tractor now this machine is almost uh, this is called the crawler transporter this is one of the largest mining machine it's made by mining people but really it transports the rocket to the launch pad this weighs about 6 million or 3 million kilos uh, it can carry up to 10 million kilos so next slide uh on some of the shoes uh, i call them the cinderella shoes on on the crawler they weigh about a ton and they do deform basically so everything in this world deforms so it's very important to understand what is a deformation characteristic so what i'm trying to impress upon is go very deeply into this system next slide so this is a mobile a picture of a mobile uh, uh, launcher platform that's where i'm carrying my whole rocket system there now the mobile launcher itself it's like a paper, largest paper weight in the world it's like 9 million pounds you know almost 4 and 1/2 million kilos so right now you are looking at almost 7 and 1/2 million kilos on a road bed which has to be designed such a way so how do you design a road road bed or a, a street which to carry 18 million pounds or 9 million kilos you know so next slide so here is a nice picture of the space shuttle i would be standing right next to the wing when we were watching nobody was allowed to go around the launch and on the pad here and so we used to take this very slowly to the launch pad and launch because this is a, a de- most delicate part of the operation that we don't want vibration to set up in these machines next slide so in the end you know it's not about the knowledge you uh, generate from your education education is important i'm not saying that that gives you the fundamentals but really when you make your hands dirty and work in the field and that's what it gives you the experience you know uh, the, the wisdom to uh, to to make sure that you make the right decisions this is the last launch by the way in july of 2011 uh, it, it's very very sad when you see the last launch of atlantis and you know uh, and come back home that day and say this is the end of the program uh, because you're launching it 100 times for the last 30 years so next slide so let's quickly look at uh, give you a big picture uh, overview i'm going to run through these slides because i want to talk a little bit about uh, biological research on the iss so i'm going to run through some of these slides so when i say you know next slide keep on clicking on it because there are some embedded slides here okay next slide so next slide so really what we want to do is is a nice quote from a national geographic i went to uh, peru uh, uh, and we, they are talking about the incas and mayas they built a staircase to heaven they wanted to see the earth from the eyes of the condor so for the right stuff to go in space safely we need reliable right stuff on the ground 
So what does right stuff mean? Right stuff means astronauts and right stuff means somebody like me, an astronaut maker. Next slide. So uh, I was a vibroacoustics engineer, systems engineer, safety engineer, and all that. We had 3 million, 3 million parts, basically, uh, 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 in, in terms of uh, the space shuttle. Um, so, you know, the journey, you know, my journey, it just didn't happen serendipitously that I just came from India and became an NASA engineer. No, it was very hard work, perseverance, uh, ingenuity, sacrificing my family and my health and many, many issues. So if you want to have your name as a gold standard, you you know you have to put your 100%. Next slide. So this is the 3 million parts of the space shuttle. Uh, next slide. Uh, so I keep on clicking. So you uh, this is the whole stack. This is the space shuttle main engine, the external tank, the solid rocket boosters. So this we call it the cathedral of technology. This is one of the finest machines. This will never be built in the history of mankind because it was expensive, but it, it did help to build the ISS and build, uh, help us to build uh, the, send the uh, Hubble Space Telescope. Next slide. So if you look at this chart here, uh, it gives you the next slide. Yeah, space shuttle processing flow from the top, space shuttle landing, uh, all the way to uh, uh, launching. So keep on clicking. So we have different organizations, many, many centers doing uh, the, the different parts of the uh, vehicle. So some do the space shuttle main engine, some do the vehicle, and some do the other parts. And we also do testing up in Johnson Space Center for humans to work underwater to see what's happening. Next, uh, keep on clicking. Uh, this is the control center. Next slide. Uh, keep on clicking. Kennedy Space Center. So this is a beautiful picture of the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, click again. Uh, so you can see where we are. The red dots signifies that's where the humans went to space, went to a moon, uh, and many, many probes from there. So it is a barrier island. I find it species of birds, animals, mammals, reptiles there. But what is more important is a historic landmark where people of very high self-esteem, kings, queens, ambassadors. You know, the first day I walked from the launch pad, I was walking uh, through history, basically, walking in the same footsteps as most famous people in the world. Next slide. Uh, so this is a, a, a launch complex, uh, 39 facilities. Next, click again. Uh, next slide. So you can see the uh, rocket launch pad, and this is the... VAB or vehicle assembly building, but that's where all the uh, assembly came into together, all the components of the space shuttle. Next slide. So this is the uh, shuttle landing facility. We cutely call it the alligator tanning facility because alligators would go and sleep on the, uh, on the surface. This is the longest runway in the world, almost three mile long runway. And uh, uh, both sides can be used. And so we would call the 911 um, the, uh, this uh, people and they would bring cold water and disperse the alligators. Uh, next slide. So uh, shuttle would land there. Next slide. So we bring the shuttle uh, back to the office. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is uh, bringing the uh, uh, this tank. Next slide. This is solid rocket booster, by the way. So solid rocket boosters fall in the ocean and we have to, uh, next slide tow with our uh, own ships, and these ships uh, go and retrieve the solid rocket boosters. So that is the reusable part on the space shuttle. Next slide. So here is where we are towing with the ship, and this uh, 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 whole segment will be reused by modifying it. Next slide. This is how the segment looks after launching in space. This is one of the most powerful rocket engine in the world. Next slide. So uh, we also used uh, this, uh, these are seven segmented rocket boosters. So we keep on one on top of the other to make the entire rocket booster. Next slide. So we, they come on by railroad from Utah, one of the states up in the Western part of the United States. Next slide. Uh, and then we uh, bring the uh, segments into our office. Next slide. And this is how it's stacked, one on top of the other like a donut, on one top of the other like a Lego set. Next slide. And then finally, 
we put the nose cone and everything goes into the VAB and then assembled together. Next slide. Uh, this is the OPF or the orbiter processing facility. From once we land the orbiter, it comes here. Next slide. So we take out the engines, we repair the engines and stuff like that. Next slide. So we uh, change uh, uh, the hazardous materials uh, like monomethyl hydrazine, nitrogen tetroxide, which is inside there. So we have a couple of different types of fuels inside the shuttle. Next slide. Now the engineers are working on the payload. Next slide. This is the main engine replacement. We saw the picture of that earlier. Next slide. So then it's ready now. It's going to be rolled over to the VAB as another component of the whole integration process. Next slide. Now the external tank comes from one of the uh, closer uh, areas for, from Kennedy Space Center. Uh, uh, it's uh, Louisiana, so very close to us, but it comes by barge. Next slide. So it makes this journey and then we bring uh, the barge very close to Kennedy Space Center. And uh, Next slide. And then we tow it uh, uh, through our waterways. Next slide. And then finally, we uh, have a cro uh, transporter which we put this uh, tank on and bring it to the VAB or the vehicle assembly building. Next slide. So now we are bringing it inside the VAB and we can store it about 10 of them. So whenever we need one, we just use them. Next slide. So now the biggest challenge is to, uh, this is the VAB, it's one of the largest, uh, you know, I think third largest building in the world. Uh, uh, it is amazing uh, that on that American flag, one strip, a stripe, we can run a bus through that, you know, it's as wide as that, basically. Uh, next slide. So now here we are bringing the rocket booster segment and we'll bring it to the mobile launcher, that big paperweight we talked about. Next slide. And then we'll bring the orange tank uh, and put it right in the center between the two solid rocket boosters. Next slide. And then now is the biggest challenge for me. This orbiter weighs uh, 200,000 pounds or 100,000 kilos. You know, I won't be the, I didn't want to be the person who drops that. That costs about $5 billion. <laughs> I'll lose my job that day, you know. So next slide. That will be the pretty, most critical, stressful day for me. Now, everything is assembled together. Next slide. So now we can move it to the, on the crawler transporter and put it on the mobile launcher and move it to the launch pad. Next slide. So this is a crawler transporter. You saw the mobile launcher. Next slide. There's a mobile launcher on top of the crawler transporter. You can see how big it is, okay? And we are talking their combined weight is almost about uh, 15 million, almost seven and a half million kilos. So next slide. So this is the launch pad, one of the finest pads. Uh, this is a moon pad actually, launch pad 39A. That's where Neil Armstrong went to moon. Next slide. Uh, this is a farther away picture. Uh, beautiful Atlantic Ocean on the right here. Uh, next slide. This is a water system where we put about 300,000 gallons of water on the launch pad to cool so that because we are getting tremendous amount of heat, almost 3,000 degrees temperature on the launch pad with the exhaust uh, rockets. Next slide. So here is where we are bringing the payload. This payload compartment would be something like bringing the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, next slide. And then we'll open up the payload compartment and we open up, uh, we'll bring it and put it in the orbiter. Next slide. So this is the launch control center. This is the, uh, there is no uh, red button we press anymore. It's all computerized, you know. At about T minus 31 seconds, all the control goes to the computer of the space shuttle which is about three miles away from this center. Next slide. This is inside of the space center. Uh, every single system on the log uh, of, of three million systems, uh, uh, I mean, three million parts, there are hundreds of thousands of systems. Everything is controlled and monitored and censored basically. Next, next slide. Here are some of the engineers. I would be sitting somewhere here as like the uh, representative from uh, safety. Next slide. And these are some of the control uh, system people 
who support the launch director basically and all these people feed into the launch director who is sitting on the top uh, right here and once everybody is happy then we go for launch after polling to make sure everybody is okay next slide so here is the launch director and his window and you can see the shuttle lift off on the background there a uh, tiny picture of that with the smoke and the plume rising about the horizon horizon basically next slide so launching probes to far away planets uh, and the sun in my first year at nasa in 1989 90 i launched magellan to venus next slide ulysses to the sun next slide and galileo to jupiter so amazing feat you know uh, as a small boy growing up in mumbai i would just dream about just look up to space all i did was flying kites now i was flying rockets 25 years later it is an amazing amazing journey that that one can do you know if you put your mind to it next slide not only that we put uh, hubble space telescope but we had the courage to go and send our astronauts and put them uh, in harm's way to repair and retrieve and return the satellites from space which is really why we need the manned space exploration and andy thomas hats off to him is my good friend but he's one of the greatest astronauts also next slide so launching hubble and repairing it you know uh, next slide uh, some of these these are some of the pictures of the hubble space telescope uh, as you see uh, coming over uh, there is many many of them next one is really special i think uh, uh, various nebula and the entire solar system next slide um all kinds of galaxies and stuff like that far far away human eyes cannot see the next slide so this slide really are the three fingers we call it the three fingers are that's where the birth of stars is and that's where earth was formed once upon a time and then earth you know once it started the whole galaxy floated out and came to where we are how do we know that we know the light coming from there so knowing the speed of the light we know how long ago it was so basically it was almost like 14.5 billion years that earth was formed and slowly slowly it came towards uh, uh, where we are in the solar system now or our, our, our milky way basically and this is a separate milky way they are far away from uh, earth's milky way next slide so building the international space station was a, it was a palace in the sky a global earth observation platform the shuttle made it possible von braun who was one of our uh, german uh, uh, engineers and astronauts i uh, mean engineers who we brought up to the second world war uh, he was instrumental in thinking about putting man on moon but he was also thinking about how to build the international space station and uh, really uh, you know he was instrumental in designing the space shuttle to to put the parts next slide so this is this is a picture of uh, the inside of the space shuttle one of the modules next slide so you can see the entire uh, space station built here some of the modules are russian some of the modules are japanese some are italian modules some are, uh, a lot of uh, them are american modules next slide this is the solar arrays it's uh, designed as if it's like a, a, a firefly or something like that you know next slide next slide so this is uh, uh, also one of the windows we have on the uh, space station it's called the cupola and it has many many areas people can sit and take pictures of their earth so it's not fun really uh, they are not having fun they are really working and trying to understand how our earth uh, behaves you know a uh, lot of times we don't really uh, who is watching you know when you go to the beach you know the lifeguard is looking after you uh, for for uh, any problems with sharks or some uh, undercurrents or whatever but who is watching mother earth you know international space station we go around the world every 90 minutes 16 times a day we see 16 sunsets and sunrises next slide and we are watching for tsunamis and many many things this is 
where my last job was, this is called the uh, Space Station Processing Facility. It's just a 100,000 class clean room. If you see a lot of modules there on the left uh, uh, corner here, um, uh, towards the picture, there's a test for the facility where some of these modules were kept and checked out with uh, plumbing and everything else. See this, uh, each launch costs a half a billion dollars. So once you send the probe to space, it was impossible to get them back. So it was very, very important for NASA to make sure everything works in space. There's no return policy in space. See, if you buy some hardware from a store, you can go and return it, but not in space. You have to throw it away. Next slide. So this is how uh, it was built and designed like a Lego set. And you know, I personally launched 400 payloads uh, in the last five years of my job as a ground safety review panel. That is one of the highest jobs I had at NASA. Uh, in charge of all the payloads going to the International Space Station, whether it's a mice, tiny mice, Japanese mice, or a $5 billion alpha magnetic spectrometer looking for dark matter, all those things were sent by me in the last five years. Uh, so uh, this is just an animation of how individual parts were sent. We had many, many launches from Russia, many launches from America, and each part had to be sometimes kept at a different place. So this is a logistical nightmare. Uh, this is, weighs almost half a million kilos, one million pound. Uh, it's one of the most expensive object ever built by mankind at a uh, cost of about $250 billion right now. So next slide. Uh, Arbina wanted me to talk a little bit about uh, some research. So we'll just uh, briefly go over the, the three areas. We have a, what they call an ISS National Laboratory on, in space. Uh, we do NASA research, but also we do international partner research, meaning other countries like ESA and JAXA, Japanese Space Agency, they all also do the research. And the research is, uh, next slide, uh, the research is done in many, many areas. Um, so biological research, human physiology, physical material science, uh, technology demonstrations, like what we are doing on Mars now. So all and long duration effects on uh, uh, how, how to live and work in space uh, and basically uh, uh, it will help us to go to Mars someday, you know, sending humans to Mars basically. So it is important that, that uh, you know, we built a space station where mankind uh, went to live and work in space. Next slide. So this is a, a, a biotechnology demonstrations. Uh, as I said, you know, we not only uh, use biological laboratories uh, uh, and experiments for microorganisms, cells, tissue cultures, small plants, uh, many, many things. And we have a couple of centrifuges to provide artificial gravity. Uh, we also have microscopes and all the equipment there to do the research. So these astronauts are trained to do the research, uh, basically. Next slide. So ISS, uh, next slide. Um, basically, uh, this is an express rack. You know, it has some growth chambers. And, uh, sorry, go back. Um, so uh, it has uh, uh, what many, many racks and sub racks. These are, this one is called Advanced Biological Research System. It has chambers capable of uh, controlling temperature, uh, illumination. You can put colored lights on it, ultraviolet lights on it, atmospheric composition. And stuff like that, and we can we have grown lettuce and tomatoes and many many things. And these are right, you know, without the benefit of soil. So the idea is to grow food in space. So for long duration journey to Mars, um, you know, nine months journey, we'll be growing our own food on the uh, on the rocket, basically on on uh, along the journey, basically. So that, that that's the whole plan here. Next slide. So here again. The plant growth experiment. We had uh, uh, also a plant growth experiment called Veggie from uh, Kennedy Space Center, which was sent to. Uh, you can Google all this information from from NASA websites, uh, www.nasa.gov, because I'm not an expert in all these areas. But uh, having delivered many many probes to space, I know a lot about it. Next slide. So uh, another important aspect of uh, um, uh, studies is we lose about 1% muscle and bone mass 
every month we stay in space. So they have to work at least three hours a day on many, many devices. And we have uh, some of the devices called ARED, which is the rightmost. Uh, it's a resistive type exercise, which will promote uh, you know, degradation of bones and muscle mass, basically. So uh, one of our astronauts, he's you know, diligently worked very hard to exercise every day, maybe more than three hours. And he, you know, he didn't lose much of the bone and muscle mass on ret upon return from uh, space, basically. Next slide. So uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, studies done for uh, using tomography and all this equipment. Not only the astronauts give us the feedback, but also they provide data from space. So the doctors and engineers and uh, scientists working on the ground are continuously working with them uh, to, to control the diet, exercise and stuff like that so that we can prevent the bone and muscle lo loss. You know. Next slide. So uh, understanding various uh, mechanisms uh, of, uh, say, osteoporosis. I myself have sent uh, mice to space from Japan. Uh, one small story, one time, uh, Japanese sent about 30 mice to space, uh, to Kennedy Space Center to go to space. And they also sent the cheese, but some one of my engineers or technicians forgot to turn the thermostat uh, control properly uh, in the refrigerator and all the my, uh, cheese went bad. So unfortunately, the only cheese these mice would eat is the Japanese uh, cheese from Japan. <laughs> so and two days later, I had to fly these mice to space on a rocket to go to ISS. So I had to call Japan. And they were really mad at me, but we had to pay, end up paying quarter million dollars to get the cheese from Japan to fly to space. You know? So uh, kind of stories, we have a lot of fun stories uh, as we go along. Next slide. Uh, we also look at the bacterial pathogens. I've worked with uh, uh, looking at stem cells, as I said, uh, tissue cultures, microorganisms um, from various parts of the world. And all these, uh, this is one for salmonella, salmonella poisoning. Um, and stuff like that. Uh, but there are many, many uh, tests we are doing and these tests and all the data uh, is already published quite a bit, you know. Uh, for every test or every experiments we have, we have hundreds of uh, papers written already. So you can Google and find out. The next slide. This is a nice picture uh, It was sent to me, fruit flies. So why do we send fruit flies to space? Because fruit flies, you know, they, they uh, can you click on the bottom one? The uh, top one is a fruit fly, uh, which is one week old, which is equal to seven years of humans. So seven year old. The, uh, the bottom one is a heartbeat of a uh, fruit fly, which is at uh, seven weeks, uh, almost seven times. That's almost 10 times the human years. So you can see how slow the heartbeat is. So why we study fruit flies is because 70% of the human diseases on earth, you know, come from, uh, the fruit flies can have the same diseases. So sending fruit flies, and they also reproduce very fast. So I can study five generations of fruit flies within a week rather than doing the experiment on any other kind of uh, system, basically, or any kind of other kind of uh, uh, bird or, uh, you know, fly or whatever, you know. Uh, so this is why we do experiments on fruit flies. So next slide. So... Uh, I think we had some people in robotics. So robotics, uh, we have robonauts on, on uh, International Space Station. Now our robotic precursors are flying on Mars. So ro robots and NASA is amazing. Uh, uh, this is the International uh, Space Station Canada arm, which was given to us by Canada. And uh, NASA used to do the brain surgery, a miniature version of this uh, robot arm was used to do a brain surgery on Earth, actually, for a small boy. And it was very, very successful. So we not only use these robotic arms in space, but also on Mars, but also on, on Earth, you know, uh, to do help uh, help us with what we are doing. Chemotherapy is next one, next one. So many, many people have a cancer. Uh, next slide. So, uh, you know, we do have targeted chemotherapy instead of just, you know, loading up the whole body, basically, especially, you know, people with uh, breast cancer and other things. You know, this is a very unique way of doing things. And the technology is being developed as we speak and, you know, perfected. Next slide. Again, a little bit of robotic uh, help on space. 
you know, they, uh, the advantage was of the space shuttle was it was in the low Earth orbit, about 300 kilometers above Earth. And the beauty about it was we could go and get a satellite and grab it and bring it back to Earth. Uh, whereas no other vehicle today can uh, is capable of doing that. And not only that, we can bring it into the payload compartment of the space uh, shuttle in space and repair it right there also. And that's how we repaired the Hubble. So when we captured the Hubble by going very close to it. Both are going around the world at 90 minutes. Every 90 minutes, they're going at Mach 25. So we have to rendezvous, come and catch it, grab it, bring it to the uh, you know, uh, payload compartment and repair it. And the last time was STS-125 in 2009, 2010. We repaired the Hubble and it has been working perfectly for uh, last 10 years. Next slide. <coughs> well, we don't forget our buddies from Australia too. So this is a Great Barrier Reef. Or oh, go back one slide. <laughs> okay, this is the east coast of Australia. I've been to Great Barrier Reef for Keynes many times. Uh, so uh, we do take pictures of beautiful uh, landscape around the world to to show the people that, you know, hey, we have the capability to see if there is any degradation, forest fires, tsunamis, hurricanes, uh, you know, volcanoes and things like that. You know. Next slide. So this is the beautiful picture of the International Space Station. Really, uh, it's a lifeguard for the world, a lifeguard for the space. I mean, if you are today running around Brisbane, you can just go around your city. You can't be looking around uh, what is happening in Perth or, uh, uh, or some other city, right? So... Basically, ISS can do that because we can pass over any city 90, uh, every 90 minutes, 16 times a day and capture what is going on on different parts of the world at the same time. Um, next slide. So this is uh, Theodore von Karman was uh, uh, one of our directors on JPL. As I said, uh, Space Shuttle was designed at least in part to broaden our knowledge of the universe. Uh, to scientists, it was a tool, but engineers, it was their creation, basically. So scientists study the world as it is. It's good that we scientists, uh, many times people ask, are you a rocket scientist? I say, no, I'm a rocket engineer, you know, because I'm not a scientist, really. You know, I, I think uh, nobody is higher or lower. We, each one has our own expertise. So you can become a scientist or an engineer or anything else, basically. So, uh, but we all work in harmony and, you know, uh, there's nothing wrong in saying that you're the best rocket engineer in the world, you know, so uh, it doesn't mean anything else. So next slide. So we had one of our best uh, uh, launch teams in the world. Uh, these are some of my fellow astronaut uh, makers. I mean, we had 20,000 people. Globally, I have 1 million people used to work for NASA, but not all of NASA employees, they're contractor employees. NASA had about maybe from the inception in 1958, we may have earned about 30,000 people working directly for the US government. Uh, with that, we'll show you, I don't know whether we can get the sound, uh, but uh, go ahead, next one. Next slide. You can increase the volume, yeah. Uh -huh. Go back and start again. There, there she goes. Uh, we are talking about the precise uh, T0. Uh, this is the countdown to T0, basically. And uh, there's a trick question, when do you become an astronaut? Not when uh, Andy Thomas was uh, uh, accepted in NASA as an astronaut candidate or when he goes to space. Uh, you saw the liftoff a minute ago when the rocket lifts off on its own weight uh, with its own rocket power one inch above the ground, you know, one inch above the ground, that's when you become an astronaut. So um, we were so proud that, you know, we uh, launched, uh, out of my 100 rockets uh, I launched in from 1989 to 2011, we never had a problem with uh, liftoff. Columbia uh, happened during landing and Challenger happened before I came to NASA. It happened in 86. But that doesn't mean that, you know, we don't take responsibility. You know, we, 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 we are very honest about it and we take the responsibility that something hap wrong happened and it's a team, team problem. So in closing, uh, next slide. So I just want to 
uh, in about 10 minutes, I'll just close uh, all this stuff and I want to quickly show you a last video. Um, next slide. You want, in the end, you want to leave a legacy. You know, uh, Shackleton is my hero, uh, just like uh, uh, Tenzing Norgay, uh, who climbed Mount Everest in 53. He said, I met him in 73. He said, uh, Ravi, you know, uh, Everest is already taken. You find, find your own mountain, peak, summit, to summit, you know. Uh, so all people listening to me today, I said, you know, you must be looking for Olympus Mons, which is three times higher than uh, uh, Mount Everest on Mars, basically. Can, you need to climb that. So this is a beautiful uh, story about endurance uh, uh, with Shackleton. And uh, we call it a spectacular, a successful failure. Success because he brought the men back, failure because he never went to the pole, just like Apollo 13. We went to the moon, but we didn't land on the moon. So it was a failure. Success because we got the three men back. Next slide. So really you can become whatever you want. Uh, click again. Uh, next slide. So you can become a physicist, an astronaut, an astronomer, whatever you want to become, you can become. You can become an astronaut maker like me. It's, it's, it doesn't matter, but be the best in whatever you do. Next slide. So the idea is uh, that, you know, with innovation, uh, you have to have passion, purpose, potential, and persevere. And this is the mass of law of hierarchy of needs, basically. You need food and shelter and all that. After that, you need security for your family and safety. Then you need belongingness and love. In the end, it's all about self-esteem. But then if you want to be the best and meet the, go to the top of the pyramid like Andy Thomas, you have to fulfill all your needs and go to the fullest potential. Next slide. So I just put this slide. Uh, this is a lady from uh, France. I was giving a lecture. She was standing uh, looking at me and she's a French lady. And I was give, uh, speak, speaking in English. And for two hours I spoke and she didn't have a last half an hour until last half hour. She didn't have anything on the screen. But in the last half hour, she put the whole two hour lecture on one slide. And she's not even an engineer. You know, I was just I just want to impress upon you that, that anything is possible. Next slide. So four things you have to learn in your life. If you fi fail, find the root cause. So proximate cause, if we call it is a technical like in the example of uh, uh, space shuttle uh, challenger, it o-ring was the technical problem. The root cause was a human error because the managers didn't think that it was a big problem. Adopt systems thinking. Don't think that your car just runs on tires you know, or engine or whatever. You know, you have to understand the whole car, whole system and how they work together. Uh, develop multidisciplinary knowledge and skills just like Leonardo da Vinci. You know, He was a painter, he was an architect, he was a builder, he built helicopters. You know, uh, he built war machines, things like that. In the end, you have to reflect, introspect, and tell the story, basically. Next slide. So my boss uh, always used to call me and say, hey, Rabi, you know, how, how can sky be the limit when there are footprints on the moon? So if you want to become an astronaut maker, next slide. So the most important thing you have to have is the self-esteem. Once you have self-esteem, I launched 100, I mean, 700 astronauts, almost 600. And one of the most important things they say that self-esteem is the most important thing. Otherwise, you'll never go anywhere. Next thing is fear, have no fear and take all the risks. Next slide. So here's a picture of uh, STS-107 astronauts the day they went to the launch pad. Uh, you see the girl in the uh, leftmost corner here. That's Kalpana Chawla. And uh, I was two feet away from her that day and she waved goodbye to me. And I think I was the only last person to, she spoke to me, I guess, after that they went into the van and they never came back. So uh, next slide. Next slide. So uh, self-esteem, uh, uh, passion are key to success. Have no fear, take a lot of risks. This is aim high. Uh, there's a book called Infinite Worlds. I wrote the last chapter in the book. It's not my book, actually. Uh, if you want to read that, there's a beautiful book on Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, it's a must read by, it's a book by astronauts actually. And I was not an astronaut, but I was invited to write the book. Next slide. Uh, you know, if you want to really be the best in the world, fly with eagles, don't uh, fly with crows and sparrows and other things. Uh, there are two great people in the, in the picture. 
on the left is my dad i'm in the center and the, on the right is the uh, president of india he also happens to be one of the genius rocket engineers just like me and uh, he built the indian space agency his name is dr abdul kalam you can google him next slide and most of them you know if you want to be the best follow the best like astronaut pamela melroy she is now part of adelaide group there i don't know what exactly she is doing but that's the silver snoopy award uh, uh, she gave me in 1996 there's a silver uh, snoopy dog uh, from the disney uh, films it uh, the pin goes to space and she takes it to space comes back to her and gives me this pin and and uh, uh, you only get it once in your lifetime uh, that symbolizes that you are one of the best engineers um, yeah, it's an astronaut award you know and uh, it's very hard to get it next slide uh and this one is a picture in adelaide i i don't even remember i think this must be 1995 uh, uh or so and that's with tandy thomas he graduated from uh, uh, adelaide university and uh, that's colin hansen one of his uh, best buddies so three people came to america andy thomas colin hansen and one of my best friends uh, uh he passed away you know uh, so this unfortunately uh, we don't have him as a part of the team here now so next slide so uh this is roy bridges one of my astronaut friends uh and also uh he always uh, uh helped me to grow uh as i said you know you you have a good mentor in some of the people so the writing on the wall uh, on the bottom it says thanks for all your contributions uh, to the nation space program so coming from somebody who is an astronaut but also a center director uh, for nasa it's a great thing next slide so we talked about change earlier uh, you have to become the change but think believe in yourself dream and dare if you do all the three or four the first ones but if you don't dare don't get off your back you know nothing is going to happen next slide uh the book you saw earlier uh, um the infinite worlds so this is a museum we built after the atlantis got retired so this is a 200 million dollar museum and atlantis is sitting like that and the columbia challenger memorial uh, where the memorial of the astronauts is sitting sit uh, in, in this uh, area here on the left you see a box on the right and that's where my picture is on the wall so i'm sharing space with atlantis but also i'm sharing space with uh, the astronaut i launched in space next slide so this is a picture of uh, next slide the person uh, no go back please yeah uh this is uh, on the right it is uh, astronaut bill macarthur is one of uh, he's taking a picture of my picture with the picture on the wall and this guy is the most powerful person in nasa he was the chief of uh, safety and engineering for the entire space shuttle program an entire space station program four time astronaut genius and he was my boss so uh, it is a great pleasure to take pictures with people like this not because you want to tell the world but you want to you know use it to inspire the next uh, next generation next slide and that's bill macarthur in space actually that's uh, so i want i'm here to push you gently not not in a bad way to reach your own peak uh reach your own heights uh, just like uh, tenzing norge did he told me he said find your own heights so yeah i found my pyramid you know not the pyramid of giza but the pyramid of pyramids of nasa and uh that's the launch pads where man went to moon and i got to uh work there because it came with hard work perseverance and you know tenacity um with that uh, i i don't have anything to give you today uh, next slide uh but i can give you this gift and this is the greatest gift i can give you today let it run can i put some volume uh, it doesn't matter don't worry
Next slide. So until you know how to fly and you fly, you don't know the privilege of being an eagle. So you have to, if you want to be an eagle, you have to do something, you have to fly, you know, you have to work hard and be the best. Thank you. We are open for questions now. Hey, we made it four minutes ahead. <laughs> Right. Thank you so much for the lecture. So now we'll be moving on to the Q&A session. We'll have Josh to yeah. answer some questions. Yeah. All right. I'll put the video on, eh? Uh, oh, can you, can you see me? Yeah, can you, I can see oh, you. Excellent. That was an amazing talk. Uh, we've had a few questions as, um, from it. So I'll just pull those up. Uh, there you go. All right, so uh, the first question we have is, uh, how did you go from working to Boeing, uh, uh, working at Boeing uh, to working at NASA? Um, I think uh, the most important thing there is that, you know, you have to show the passion towards uh, space and aerospace. And as a aerospace engineer, I always, you know, my dream was to fly, but when I couldn't fly and, you know, sort of fate denied me to fly. So I had to, redirect my, you know, uh, dreams towards, uh, you know, making flight of others possible. And that's what led me to work at Boeing helicopters and, you know, designing helicopters and planes. And it so happened that Boeing uh, has many, many offices, as you saw me working in my railroads, mining, helicopters, and commercial airplanes, and in NASA in 10 years. So from 1981 to 1989, within 10 years, I went from like no technology almost to space technology. So Boeing had an office in, uh, in Florida. And uh, luckily for me, my wife also wanted to move from uh, Philadelphia to Florida. And so everything combined together. But there were a lot of barriers because uh, I didn't have a rocket background. I didn't have a shuttle background. So there were a lot of hesitation by the, by the managers in Boeing in Florida and NASA that, that I was not suitable for the job. So there is always that uh, uh, problems you will face, but engineers are engineers. So I, what is important is that engineering doesn't change just because it's a plane or a rocket. You know? So that's what we want to make uh, the managers aware. Thank you for that. That's a good um, question. That's a good question, yeah. So we have uh, another question here, uh, a little more technical. So this person who's asked this question says uh, that they've heard that the safety ratings for a lot of the materials used in spacecraft, um, they have a really low safety rating, like a, I guess, SIL rating. Um, otherwise they become over-engineered and the met uh, materials they use for it become too brittle, heavy, et cetera, too, com you know, too complicated. Um, they wanna know if it's, if it's true, if um, that these components have a low safety uh, uh, factor and how, how you um, go about optimizing that, uh, the safety rating for them? Uh, well, I, I think that that's a misconception. Maybe, maybe in one or two areas, uh, it may be okay, but in many areas, you know, weight is a penalty in going to space. So when I told you earlier that if you want to launch a rocket, which weighs about 4 million kilos, you need two more million, 6 million kilos of thrust to go up in space. So it is, Weight is a penalty. So we try to minimize the weight. That's why the space shuttle was 200,000 pounds. If you look at the helicopter flying on Mars now, ingenuity is only four pounds. So we do sacrifice uh, material sometimes, but there's a reason for it. You know, like on the space station, there are areas we do a finite element modeling to understand where a micrometeorite uh, will come and hit it. And we beef up that area. So that is the only time we beef up some of the areas, but in general, we try to keep it as light lightweight as possible because weight is a penalty. Right, yeah. Um, thank you for that. Uh, I'll just move on to the next one, if that's all right. Yeah. So, yeah, mm -hmm. no, thank you for yeah. the answer. Um, so the, uh, the next question is related to the, uh, the space shuttle. And um, this person asks uh, or says that the space shuttle heat tile system uh, posed a huge challenge in like uh, in repair and refurb refurbishment, and uh, was also occasionally da damaged by ice falling of the external tank. And they have uh, they have two questions relating to that 
event, I guess. And they say, uh, number one, what did you learn from these issues uh, for the design of the, uh, of the future heat shield? And number two, uh, do you think the, uh, the SpaceX Starship heat shield will be able to overcome these challenges uh, in it, uh, to be safe and also truly rapidly uh, re reusable? Um, well, I would uh, skip the second question about SpaceX because oh, yes. um, Sorry. I have yeah. no understanding of SpaceX and I don't want to say anything wrong, which will uh, reflect on me or NASA. So let's not talk about SpaceX. But yes, uh, we did uh, uh, have from day one, uh, from STS-1 launch uh, in April 81, 1981, uh, we had a lot of uh, problems of uh, heat shields falling are due to uh, severe acoustics and launch vibration. And uh, uh, if you uh, go back to the history of the space shuttle, we didn't have the tremendous amount of water uh, um, uh, system, uh, suppression system, sound suppression system, uh, or 300,000 gallons of water you saw in one of the slides. Um, you know, uh, we didn't have that. So that created a tremendous amount of acoustic reflections, sound reflecting, not only sound generated by the rocket exhaust about 190 decibels, but then it hits the uh, structures and then reflects. So it, it becomes additive. So on the second go around, uh, the solids were a problem basically, solid rocket boosters. So we tried to uh, you know, uh, help uh, the, the um, tile system to, to mitigate the acoustics. So that was at launch. Now. Uh, the person asked about at liftoff too. Liftoff, we did have ice falling, yes. So we started looking at ice uh, and we sent ice teams and we developed the constraints where we said, okay, if we are below a certain temperature, we won't launch. So ice doesn't form. So if there is ice formation, we stop the launch and go to the next day. You know, So that would be the second case. Now the foam started uh, shedding from the external tank and that was a major crisis. Because in Colombia, you know, you know what happened in Colombia that that we did uh, 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 have a pinhole, which created a big challenge for us on STS-107, and uh, I think there uh, the uh, Colombia Accident Investigation Board clearly faulted with the managers, who really what they did was they normalized the deviance, meaning if you have a six sigma problem, they made it to a one sigma problem by saying, hey, it's not a problem, don't worry about it, we'll go. And it so happened that the uh, foam from the external tank in a bipod ramp where it connects with the orbiter, you know, it was shedding basically. And uh, that one fine morning uh, in 2003, we just got, you know, a bit, you know, by, by, by foam shedding. So, yes, uh, uh, these uh, silica foam tiles are a genius uh, 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 in the making, basically. It's one of the most ingenious ideas ever made, you know, uh, uh, for the space program. But yes, they had a lot of problems. But NASA is uh, such that uh, for every problem, we try to address it with a uh, good solution. Not that we will always come out ahead, but if you look at uh, what happened after Columbia in 2003, we never had an accident after 2003. So that tells you that from 2003 to 2011, we had almost maybe 50 launches, nothing happened, so. So Thank the, you. The, uh, that's very interesting how you guys learned from failures so well. <laughs> I wish yes, I we, that is the beauty about NASA. We always learn from our failures and we, uh, we, uh, we tell people what's uh, right and wrong and we fight with the managers. I have a nine, eight or nine inch scar on my heart, you know, uh, when I fought with the manager uh, for the Hubble launch in uh, 2009, I ended up in the hospital with a quadruple bypass. So we are not afraid to speak up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, thanks for that. I'll move on to the next question now. Um, so this one's more related to uh, astronauts, like their, uh, their health in space. And uh, this person says uh, that they were reading about how zero gravity affects muscles and bones can, can uh, and alter your, the growth of cells for the astronauts in space. And um, they suggest that, or they mention a, a potential solution is bioprinting where they uh, print live tissue and organs in space. Is this uh, something you've heard of? And uh, do you think that this is possible? 
Uh, I'm sure, uh, well, we do lose 1% of bone and muscle mass every month you stay in space. Uh, so basically, yes, uh, we have a, a device or solution for that, which is called the ARED advanced resistive exercise uh, device. So that uh, exercise device uh, goes against the gravity and tries to help the bone and muscle mass. Uh, now, as far as the, um, uh, you know, 3D printing and stuff like that, I haven't heard about it. I'm sure NASA does many, many things in many private companies, uh, which are, we are not privy to until it happens. So if he has read it somewhere, I'm, I'm trusting his judgment because I haven't read it you know, or I haven't followed it. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, there's a lot of projects in NASA, I assume. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands of projects. So it's hard to keep up with everything. So, yeah, I can imagine. Um, so, I'll move on to the next question then. And um, this person uh, is asking relative to how, uh, based on your presentation about your earlier life, and uh, they said that you talked about struggling in school and uh, not being as good uh, as an academic. And they say, what is the one thing that helped you achieve your dreams working at NASA? Uh, it's a very good pondering question, actually. Um, I, I, think, I think you don't have to get all A grades to, to work at NASA, you know. I think uh, it, it is the passion and the purpose uh, of, of what you really want to do and, uh, you know, uh, be a team member and stuff like that. So uh, yes, you know, education is very important to NASA. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in engineering from India and then I have a master's in aerospace from IIT Chicago, I have an MBA, I have a PhD. So my salary is based on all these degrees, you know. So if you are more degrees, double PhDs, you get more salary in NASA. So they always look up to uh, education. But also they think education is very important because that gives you the foundation uh, of the pyramid basically. And uh, so that helps you to go to the top. But I think more importantly, uh, what I learned, uh, you know, I gave you the four parameters there, um, which, which uh, I myself didn't know about it until I came to NASA. And, uh, and what I developed there is my own development, but it's based on NASA failures in the past. 60 years of failures I studied going back to 1958. And I came up with those four uh, things. One is find the root cause. And the root cause is not the proximate cause. It's engineering, technical related, but find the real root cause, which is a human error. Second, you uh, understand the systems in our engineering of systems. Uh, uh, to, to launch a rocket with 3 million parts uh, time and time again, uh, each launch costing $500 million. One day delay is $1 million. It's a big challenge, you know, and so you have to understand how each part fits into the whole big picture. Uh, the third thing is multidisciplinary. Remember, I told you about railroads. So what has railroads to do with NASA? So when I came to NASA, I thought, look, these guys are bugging me saying, look, uh, you're a railroader. You're not a NASA engineer, really. You know, you don't understand rockets. But when I went to the launch pad, you won't believe that many, many of our systems we have what they call as a rotating service structure on the launch pad uh, that moves on the railroad track. We have side flame deflectors that moves on the railroad track. We have the main flame deflectors to deflect the plume that moves on railroad track. So guess what? And even the solid rocket boosters, when we get it from Utah, it came on railroads. So I became an instant hit because I knew everything about how the wheel rail interaction or tribology happens. Tribos means friction, wear and lubrication. So even as a, I bat my eyelid, you're going through friction wear and lubrication. So it's just that, just because I'm a railroader doesn't mean that I can apply my knowledge from uh, 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 railroad uh, wheel and rail to, to your eyes, you know, because I can understand how friction happens, how wear happens, how lubrication is needed, you know, to fix that problems. So this is the beauty about, so basically looking at root cause analysis of any problem you have, and systems engineering, multidisciplinary knowledge of many, many areas. I knew mining, I knew uh, helicopters, I knew, I knew sensors, I knew testing, I knew uh, mechanical engineering, I knew structural engineering. Uh, 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 so all these areas will come, into, uh, come in handy. So education is just one part of it. You know? uh, 
you can take hundreds of courses you'll never be a rocket scientist or rocket engineer why because first of all you need to have passion second of all you need to have uh, uh, the hands on experience and yes hands on experience doesn't come if you don't work there right so that's that's the problem so people have to trust you and believe you and to give you a, a job in the process so i, I think uh, my failure in the early part of my career came because maybe i was not good at um, uh, solving uh, uh, you know mathematical problems or maybe you know understanding uh, uh, you know the equations or whatever or memorizing things uh, many many issues but once i came to nasa you know like like uh, i worked there 30 years but even before i went into nasa i had a book on everything about kennedy space center and everything about astronauts and the launch pad and every single acronym or most of them i knew uh, 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 what it meant so that is the preparation i call it and you know and then once i came to nasa i became not only the vip tour guide for nasa kennedy space center but also international public speaker so i used to take kings and queens and ambassadors and four star generals and uh, presidents uh, for tours so i had to know i had to be the best of best you know to know all that so that is where the difference comes is uh, having that passion and going after the knowledge but you know engineering problem solving does uh, require uh, basic education which is basic engineering and stuff like that for that i had my masters and bachelors you know which is good enough you know it's good to hear <laughs> <laughs> long long answer but i think i wanted to impress upon your students uh, that that yeah just because i failed in the exams uh, uh, doesn't mean anything you know because i still became a, uh, a nasa engineer you know so All right. Um so the next one I'll move on to you um a more technical one again. I'll just scroll through these. Sorry. <laughs> um Yes. Uh so this person uh so both the next two questions are related to um to uh, how food is grown in orbit. And um so they uh this person says do you think that fully sustainable food production like hydroponics aquaponics in space or on the ISS Uh, for astronauts is possible in the uh, near future um yes uh, it is possible and we have proven it on uh, the program called veggi uh, spelled v e g g i e you know veggi he can google veggi uh, from uh, wikipedia and then he can know everything about it so uh, i think we have a plan to grow food as we fly towards mars with uh, humans you know definitely and um what uh, this person asks is quite a brief question uh what are your thoughts on space mining very good very good if he more if he is interested there is millions and millions of uh, uh tons of uh, uh uh minerals and precious materials in in uh, uh in space basically um uh and this this could be mine basically and uh, uh all you need is a, a genius who can come up with a robotic uh, uh precursor or uh probe or we can even send humans depending upon where it is you know basically uh obviously we can't go too far but you know uh we can send robots anywhere so yes space mining you know as i told you i quoted earlier this is my personal quote space is the uh, uh, ultimate destination for mankind to orchestrate the creations of your heart and to chisel the dreams within your mind you know so whatever mind uh, th- thinks about it can shape it and uh, adding uh, polo kelo uh, that once you dream the world will collude with you to make it happen so if this uh, student wants to start thinking about space mining nasa is already ahead so he has to catch up <laughs> so maybe the and there's a lot of money to be made there there is a lot of money to be made there you know maybe they'll be uh, working with you soon <laughs> once they graduate <laughs> um all right well uh, i need i need some money from him to once he finds some gold or uh, diamond yeah. or platinum <laughs> can bring back some like diamonds and things for you <laughs> um Yep. All right. So we just have um a few last questions here. Uh I was this person just was just wondering if you could elaborate on the rely, reliability analysis process uh that was conducted for the orbiters. 
that well way. yeah it was it was a little bit tricky because uh, orbiters were never flown this is one of a kind uh, a machine you know and uh, this was we called it the cathedral of technology and uh, it was a test you know it was a test uh, object really and uh, there, there is no precedence for it you know uh, a glider uh, a, a boeing 707 type vehicle going to space uh, as a rocket and coming back as a glider classic glider you know and uh, for that you know uh, you just as I, i think there's a nice quote by uh, by by henry petrosky which i read earlier you can share that with people i want you to read the uh, uh, um, the book by henry petrosky um, uh, but but more more importantly i think engineers when they design something right you know you can take a, anything in this world you know anything is in this universe when the engineer de- designs it he just doesn't have all the information about materials about structures about environment about loadings uh, every single minute of the day and night so he uses some kind of failure criteria that may not be the right best one for you so that is where the problem comes that we always have a failure and that's why we cannot do the reliability at all but obviously you can't fly without that number so nasa did come up with the reliability equation and 1 in 100 was the plan but as you know it never materialized you know we lost two of them so really uh, 1 in 100 never never materialized so mm. right um i think there's just some questions in the chat so i'll just uh, double check them sorry i'm just going <laughs> So Stephanie has just le- uh, put a link into the chat on um, the veggie project, which based on the name, I assume uh, <laughs> has to do with the space growing um, food and space and in low orbit. So for anyone interested, just click on that link. Okay. Um, as for the questions that were submitted through the form, I'll just uh, double check that I've gone through all of them. Uh, Oh, excellent. We have a new one here which is very interesting. And they were this person is just curious to uh, to know what uh they were just wondering if you had any insight into what research NASA is currently doing in uh rotating artificial gravity in space stations. Um uh, again, I will have to defer that question with <laughs> NASA uh you know, uh, headquarters because uh, there's a lot of things happening. Uh some of it is secret some of it uh, you know even we are not uh, privy to that because uh, it is what they, it comes under like class, uh, classified work and uh, you know uh, now, as you know we we all come under these rules we call it itar which is international trafficking in arms and regulations which really uh, sort of sort of cut us off on what is needed need to know information you know so yeah i know they are doing it uh we have to do it in space uh, you know if you want to live and work in space for longer time uh, uh so basically but i don't know all the details so uh if you see any details i mean i just want to give you a good example would be like uh, sometimes hollywood or maybe even bollywood or whatever these movie people they come up with all these crazy ideas uh uh in you know, a space odyssey you know whatever Uh, movies but you know many times people think that you know which came first the chicken or the egg you know it did nasa come up with that idea or the movie came and nasa copied the movie you know so i just want to clarify that is saying that uh, movies always copy nasa so basically this producer or director would call some engineer like me and ask me some questions you know saying you know uh, how much does it cost to send a bottle of water to space and stuff like that so uh many times uh, the the people who take the data they misconstrue it and put it in the wrong fashion so we stop uh, <laughs> talking to people you know so uh i i as i said you know uh, whatever is in the literature uh, google it find out if nasa wants to put it out they will put it out because uh, they will never hide anything from anybody yeah but Uh, you must must be a fan of science fiction at NASA <laughs> naming <laughs> shuttles enterprise and things like that <laughs> sure 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 i mean yeah. some uh, rockets like uh, x33 and stuff like that which has which was right next to my office 
I couldn't even see inside what what was going on because that belonged to the uh, Department of Defense, you know, so <laughs> military. <laughs> so if I went there, I would be jailed or put in a uh, million dollar fine or whatever. So <laughs> 10 years in jail. So. All right. Uh, so I'll just uh, check if there's any other questions for those. Okay, so it looks like um, all the questions on the forms have been answered. So I'll just ask the audience that are here in, in the lecture hall if they have any uh, last questions for you, Dr. Ravi. Anyone here? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, in that case, um, I'd like to, on behalf of all the clubs here helping co-host this event, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to give this very inspiring presentation. It's definitely... Uh, given me some more motivation as an undergraduate engineering student <laughs> to uh, you know, study hard and aim for the impossible. So. Yeah, well, and I just want to close down. And, uh, you know, uh, it's important. Most of the time we are not, uh, we don't like to do this kind of uh, conferences, but because of COVID and other things, I've been trying to help the universities around the world. Um, we like face-to-face uh, -face that way. We can come and meet, you know. So I've come to Australia many, many times to Perth and Adelaide and stuff like that to, to give lectures and so, um, uh, or even to uh, Keynes and other places. So uh, maybe hopefully in future, you know, uh, when my next next trip comes and I visit Australia, I'd like to stop by, uh, uh, you know, your university and, you know, talk to the students, you know. And it's always nice to uh, have a, a, a contact and look at the face and you know give the response basically because that way you know we are uh, reinforcing our thoughts you know to them um so in closing i just all i just want to say is you know uh, a kite uh, rises against the wind you know and uh, ship is never you know, ship is always safe in the harbor just like that you know rocket is looks very pretty on the on the ground in the launch pad but that's not a ship is meant for to sit in the harbor or a kite is not meant to just stay there on the ground or rocket is you know also uh, is meant to fly in space and conquer space and so uh, you know uh, in the in the terms of what Tenzing Norge told me in 1973 when I met him he said find your own peak find your purpose you know find your passion and you know uh, until and then get up and go after it you know so that's the message I want to leave today that uh, we have given you uh, Andy Thomas, who is your greatest guy in Australia. I'm not Andy Thomas. I'm not as great as him, but I, I was privileged to launch him. I was honored to launch him. So it is important that me and Andy and people like that, you know, we have given you a jumping off platform. You know, we already built you a base. Now it is time for you to go farther than what you have done, you know. Uh, so it's not a relay race. It may be a you know, fast race. So you need to go beyond what we have done. Not just bask in the glory of the past, you know, because uh, the today's kids, they are very, very smart and intelligent, like compared to me, what I went through in my school. In fact, I failed and my parents were really upset about it. So, uh, but in your case, you know, yeah, don't worry about failure. If you fail, find the root cause and keep on learning from that. Just like Thomas Edison said, thousand times, you know, he blew up the bulb. Even his buddies ran away, his friends ran away. He said, I didn't, uh, you know, fail a thousand times. I learned th what not to do a thousand times and a thousand ways, you know. So in the end, he found the light bulb. So that is the beauty about uh, trying and failing and trying again. It's like you're going through a maze. You know, what happens if you go through a maze? You know, uh, you go and uh, make a left turn and you hit a brick, I mean, uh, maze wall. Uh, it's a maze made out of uh, grass or whatever, or uh, fern, and uh, then you turn right and then keep on doing that. So faster you go through the maze and make more mistakes, more faster you map the maze. You know. So don't be afraid to fail. And when I was growing up in India, you know, uh, failure was a taboo. You know, you know, my mom and my parents, you know, they would compare me against other people. Say, hey, look, you know, he gets a rank. You know, he he is better than you, and things like that. We shouldn't do that. You know. Nobody is better than anybody. We are all different. So I think the most important thing for us to learn is that uh, 
failure is okay but we have to learn from it you can't just say okay failure is okay and i'm done no failure is okay but you learn from lessons from the failure and move on you know to to reach the top you know uh so hopefully uh i'll write a lot of stuff in my memoir and maybe one day you guys will have a copy of it so good luck thanks thank you thank you so much Thanks, Arbina. Is she there still, or yes, she is. I'll tell Francis. Oh, yep. okay. Awesome. You, you want to add anything? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for the lecture, and thank you for everyone who came in to the lecture and everyone who tuned in online. Um, yeah, that, with that, we'll just wrap up the lecture. Thank you so much, Dr. Ravi. Okay. Good luck.